beautiful and the magnificent name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome into the Wednesday night edition of MTV's Facebook Live Bible study, immunating on behalf of Mount Vernon Mission of Baptist Church, Auburn, Alabama, where I have been privileged and honored to serve as pastor for going on some 35 years now. I, I, this broadcast seems to be a little blurred tonight, so if it's blurred, let me know so I can do something else. I, I, I am grateful for another opportunity to um, present the word of God to each of you. And hopefully in a few moments, I uh, will be simulcasting not only on my burdens, uh, not only on my Facebook page, but also on the Facebook Missionary Baptist Church. Good evening to you, even Ms. Teresa Thomas. Uh, praise God for whom all blessings flow in this, on this wonderful Wednesday. Ms. Cassandra Carlisle, good evening to you. To Ms. Ned Reese and all of our friends down 29. Uh, Ms. Yvonne H. Whitfield, good evening to you also. What a mighty awesome God we serve. Call a neighbor, call a friend, Miss Grace Tomber. Hello to you and to your family. Tell them that we will uh, present a excellent Jesus of a biblical text tonight and good evening to you. Uh, last night we ended Luke chapter number four. And those of you who have been with us any amount of time know that the original scriptures, the Bible, did not have chapters and verses. They were added respectively uh, by uh, Langford and Stephanos, 12th and 1500th. So, uh, Dr. Gina Jimmy Boykin, good evening to you. So, the original Bibles had no chapters or verses in Congo, it must have been hard to find scriptures with no chapters and verses. So we ended last night with chapter number four. My songbird is joining us again tonight. Miss Kara Dixon, Catherine's in the Magic City, Birmingham. Um, so we ended with uh, what is in the Bible is chapter four, and tonight we will deal with chapter five, or at least some of chapter five, and Tonight I'm going to be consistent with last night. We're not going to really box it. Uh, we're going to just teach the text as it is. Uh, we may give you some points, but my goal is to just allow the text to teach itself. And when you're talking about exegesis, uh, exegesis a text, what you're doing is you're completely explaining the text. Coach Whit, good evening to you. Remember on last week, now, last week, on last night, we ended with verse number 44, so let's go back to 43. It says, and he said unto them, meaning Jesus, they had come to him and told him basically that uh, there were some more folk that wanted to see him, etc., etc., etc. They saw him, verse 42, and came unto him, and he stayed, and he begged them to stay. And Jesus said unto them in verse 43, and he said unto them, meaning the crowd that wanted him to stay, Mark says that uh, these people wanted to be healed and, and they were all excited about what had happened. Uh, and he said unto them, I must preach, I must disseminate theological truth, the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. In other words, Jesus was not going to get hung up in a healing ministry when his primary purpose of his ministry was to come and now he was to heal but primarily it was to preach the gospel and the kingdom of God and before he healed the body he wanted to heal the soul and uh, so he so Jesus says I must preach I must disseminate theological truth I told you last night that uh, when you see the word preach in the Bible or teaching the Bible they're pretty synonymous now as I said in the African American church because we like to put a little gravy on it because we like to do what we call hooping and crooning. We call that preaching and and when we just disseminate truth, we call that teaching. But 
theologically in the Bible, Jesus did not uh, prune in the key of C. I'm not criticizing movement, I'm not criticizing emotionalism, just suggesting to you that that was not a biblical concept. Jesus was not on the Sermon on the Mount, whooping in the, and hollering in the key of A flat. Okay. So, uh, verse 44, and he preached in the synagogue. Okay, now y'all should know tonight, okay, don't y'all, don't play with me tonight. He preached in the synagogue, when you see synagogue, you think church, okay? Went from the tent, which was the tabernacle, to the temple, to the synagogue temple. Okay, so Jesus preached in the synagogue of Galilee. You should know from last night's teaching that Galilee is what we call the state. The two major ones was Galilee, were Galilee and Judea. Galilee was up north, Judea was down south, and in between uh, Galilee and Judea was Samaria. That was about, uh, they were about 70 miles apart, took about a day, uh, two days and a half to get there. Some of the major cities in Galilee would have been, I'm sorry, you know, in Galilee would have been Nazareth, would have been Capernaum, and some of the major cities in Judah would have been Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Bethlehem, and Jericho. Okay, and I, I, I didn't tell you last night, but tonight I, I showed this with you. The, the, the believers in, or not the people, the people, the Jews in um, Judea, uh, didn't look favorably or frowned on or considered the people of Galilee country and kind of second class citizens. But remember, Nathaniel asked the question of, uh, of his brother, uh, can any good thing come from Nazareth? And you should know by now when you see Nazareth, you think of Jesus' own town and uh, where he grew up. And uh, Nazareth was a city in Galilee. See, as I told you, I want you all not to know only about the Bible. I want you to know the Bible. So when you see Galilee, when you see Capernaum, when you see Judea, when you see Jerusalem, uh, as you study your Bible, as you read your Bible, as you fact check me, then you will know what these uh, things are. You're right, Teresa, when you see, see the word synagogue, think in terms of the word church. So he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. It took, in order to have a synagogue, we had to have at least 10 wrong men. So now let's go to what we have in our Bible as chapter number five. And it says, and it reads, and we're going to let the text be the talk. Dr. Tita Holloway, good evening to you. Um, chapter five and Luke says, and it came to pass as the, as the people pressed upon him, meaning Jesus, to hear the word of of God. That's a comma there, but I need for you to put a period. Notice the first thing that the text teaches us is that the people were enthusiastic, the people were energetic, the people were um, 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 excited about hearing, look at what the text says, the word of God. If there's anything that a good pastor, preacher, teacher, pontificator, or later a pronosticator of the gospel praise for and that is a people who are enthusiastic about hearing the word of God. look at the text they were not enthusiastic about hearing some mumbo chumbo they weren't enthusiastic they weren't pressing to be entertained they weren't pressing for um, 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 for, for, for what I call theatrical shenanigans, they were pressing to hear the word of God. That word press there has different meanings uh, in scripture. Um, you remember in, oh my God, read that, um, um, the Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter number four, uh, no, uh, number three, I, I, I think it is where Paul says, um, I press towards the mark. That word means that I strain every of the Paul always talking about reaching perfection. He's saying I'm not there, but I'm pressing towards the mark. In other words, I'm straining. I got the perfection in view and I'm straining every available muscle. I'm straining every available vein. I'm straining every, I'm, I'm, I'm straining everything within me to reach the mark of perfection. I may never reach it, but I'm straining everything I got trying to reach perfection. 
Okay, that's one way the word is used. You remember in Mark chapter number one when the four fellows put the guy on the cart and took him to Jesus and let him down, I mean, and got to the house, the Bible says they couldn't call the press, and that the word press, that means crowd. Here, I think the word press has a double meaning. It means that he was, that they were, that the crowd was so enormous until they were pressing him and pushing him literally into the, um, um, into the sea or into the lake. And so, uh, but not only can the word mean that they were pushing him, but it may mean, it may mean, glory to God, it may mean that they were so in, in enthusiastic to hear the word that they were straining everything they had to hear what the Lord has to say. We need to go back to a time where we value hearing the word of God. Why? Because they said the word by hitting my heart. And I hide it in my heart that I may not sin against you. The Bible said the word of the Lamb to my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus defeated the devil with the word of God. If there's anything a good pastor, a good preacher, a good teacher of the Bible wants, and that's all I pray for is, Lord, give me a group of people that, that will press their way to hear the word. Well, not what I have to say, but what you have to say through me. Mary, good evening to you. So, so the first thing we learn is that the people, they are pressing to hear the word of God. The B-Claw, he stood, he meaning Jesus, stood by the lake of uh, Gennesaret. Now, the lake of Gennesaret, when you get that, when you come to the lake of Gennesaret, um, uh, there are some things you need to know, uh, preachers, especially you. Uh, this uh, lake is also, it has three names. It's called the lake of Gennesaret. It's called the Sea of Tiberias, and it's also called the Sea of Galilee. And the reason you need to know that is because much of Jesus's water and, and uh, sea and lake miracles happened on this particular uh, body of water known as the Lake of the Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias, the same body of water, but it has three different names. And this, matter of fact, this is the place where you remember, I uh, think it's Mark chapter four, uh, Jesus is, is got late in the evening and Jesus told the disciples that was across the side of the sea, Jesus goes to sleep, storm arose, it was on this body of water. You remember when Jesus walked on water? It was on this body of water. You remember when Peter saw Jesus come and walk on the water in the storm and he said, Lord, if it bid you bid me to come, it was on this body of water. And the city of Capernaum, remember, was located on the south, on the northwestern shore of the Galilean Sea, the Sea of Tiberias or the Lake of Gennesaret. So Jesus uh, is standing on the Lake of Gennesaret, uh, by the Lake of Gennesaret, the people are pressing him to hear the word of God. Verse number two. And Jesus is about now. Now, now, get the scene. They are about to push Jesus into the sea, into the lake, into into Gennesaret. And Jesus looks out and he sees two boats or ships, is called, standing by the lake. Now, what we are dealing with here is we are dealing with the call of Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Jesus's first disciples. Now, disciples slash apostles. Now, write this down. A disciple, by definition, is one who is a follower of another's teaching. Okay? Jesus had 12 original followers, and these were the first four. Peter, James, John, Andrew. Peter, uh, 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 Peter and Andrew were brothers. James and John uh, were brothers. Okay? So, um, but, but when you think of disciple, when you see the word disciple, just think of student. What I try to do is, uh, I try to just give you some visual, uh, 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 everyday uh, con concept of what's going on. So when you see the word disciple, just think student. Okay? So um, um, these are his four, first four students that he's going to call. And he was standing uh, by the lake of the Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias and saw two ships standing by the lake. 
Check this out. But the fishermen were gone out of them and they were washing their nets. In verse one, I needed you to underline the people were pressing, straining everything they had. In verse two, I need for you to underline they were washing, glory to God, their nets. I could preach an hour from the fact that they were washing their nets because what they what washing their nets represented it represented the end of their work day it represented the fact that they had fish as a matter of fact if you go on and read and we'll get to it in a minute in verse number five peter tells jesus we toiled all night and called nothing so they had been fishing uh, because it was common for them to fish at night during this period in this time because that's when the fish were biting. I mean, we weren't biting because they were dragging the day, but that's when the fish were most uh, likely to get caught. Okay, so um, they were washing their nets. Now, Jesus is going to call them and tell them in verse number 10, you will be fishers of men. Don't get it twisted. Jesus did not call them to be fishers of men because they were some kind of great fisher. Now, obviously, fishermen, as a matter of fact, they, were, they had a successful business. And the point I'm trying to make here is th these were, he called them because of the principles that they had acquired and were displaying from being good fishermen. Because as a matter of fact, Jesus calls them to be fishers of men. Check this out, Ann. Check this out, Grayson. Check this out, Mary and Dr. Holloway. Jesus called them to be fishers of men when they, when they were failing at fishing. Let that sink in. They had, they had failed at fishing when Jesus called them. So Jesus didn't call them because they were great fishermen. When he called them, he called them because of the characteristics they displayed to become good fishermen. And check this out. And, and you hear preachers all the time say, well, he's calling us to be fishers of men. The devil is lie. He ain't calling me to be fishers of men because I don't like fishing. Never liked fishing, never wanted to go fishing. Fishing has always, to me, been a colossal waste of time. I'm not criticizing those of you who like going fishing. I never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever wanted to go fishing. I went fishing one time. They put me in the boat. I turned the boat over. They got mad and never took me again. Reverend Stowe, good evening to you. Miss Bernice A. Dell Wallington, I don't like fishing. So Jesus wouldn't have called me to be a fisher of men. What Jesus is doing, he's calling them because of the principles that they apply to become good fishers of men. See, I've been an athlete all my life, so Jesus would tell, he wouldn't call me to be a fisher of men, he would call me to use the same things that made me become successful in athletics, he calls me to use those to be successful in ministry. Devil, if you, um, uh, whatever you are good at, whatever, uh, uh, because, check this out, in order to be um, a good fisherman, look at what the text says. It says they were washing their nets, which suggests to me that they had, um, um, that they were disciplined enough. Yeah, I like eating fish as long as it's filleted, but I'm not going out there putting no nasty worm on my hand and then getting the fish out. No, it ain't gonna happen. It, it, it ain't gonna happen, but for those of you who like fishing, God bless you, Bunny. Good evening to you. So the fact that they were washing their neck lets me know that they were preparing for the next day. They, they, uh, uh, they, 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 what, what, what am I trying to say? They took care of the little detail. And if you're going to be successful in ministry, you must learn to be attentive to the little detail. Miss Eden, that, that, that's been one of my problems all my life. I'm not attentive to the detail. Devil, I love to paint. I do my own painting. I do my own yard. I, 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 I detail my own car. Why? Because I'm arrogant, narcissistic enough to know, uh, to believe that you can't clean bed me. You can't wash my car bed me. You can't do my yard bed me. Now, there are some professional painters that can paint better than I can, but I love to paint. I paint my own house just several uh, weeks ago. I went to Renee house to help her paint her entire house. And so, uh, uh, but my problem is burning 
burn his ADL wallet is I'm not a stickler for detail, so I don't put the plastic down before I paint. I just go to trimming and go to paint, and I end up spending more time getting the paint up that if I had just put cover down. So what Jesus, so what I'm saying unto you is, these men were preparing for the next day. They had an eye for detail because if they don't wipe the net, if they don't clean the net, they got all that gook, all that dead stuff, all that grass in it, and by the time they fished at night, and by the time they get back the next night, glory to God to do their job, now they have to go get a whole new net. He calls them because of the characteristics they displayed in fishing would be beneficial to them in ministry. The Bible said uh, uh, in verse number uh, five, uh, Peter told him, man, we, we work all night. That means they had a, a good work ethic. They work all night. Whatever gift God has given you, Good evening, Reverend Reverend. Whatever gift God has given you. You see, God can take a secular, a gift that you've been using in the secular world, give it an anointing and make it work for him. God can take somebody like a drug dealer and say, okay, you got a gift. You got a gift of persuading people. He's not going to tell that drug dealer, I'll make you bishop men. No, he'll say, I'll make you a persuader of men. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you an anointing. I'm going to change you and give you an anointing. And the same way you persuaded people to take drugs, I want you to, take, to, to persuade them to get high on me. The only people that Jesus told I make you fisher of men were these fishers, were these fishermen. He didn't tell Matthew I make you fisher of men. He didn't tell the other disciples I make you fisher of men. No, he took what they were disciplined in and was disciplined, disciplined in doing what's right all the time when nobody is looking. Luke chapter 5, verse number 2. He, he said, they were washing their nets, getting ready to go home. If I had to point the first verse, it would be the people present. If I had to point, the, uh, to point verse two as we exegete the text, I would talk about Peter's plan. Peter had made it up in his mind. It's been a long day. It's been an unfru unfruitful day. I'm going to wash my net. I'm going home. Check out verse three. And he, meaning Jesus, entered into one of the ships, which was Simon. Now, you know by now, Simon was also Peter. Simon is his Hebrew name. Peter is his English name. Cephas is his Aramaic name. Petros is his Greek name. Okay? So we see where Simon is, and we've already taught you, when it relates to disciples, is Peter, is Cephas, is um, um, Petros. Okay? So he, so he steps in to Peter's boat. Covering the grace, yes, it, it's integrity. He stepped into Peter, to Peter's boat. And if I had to point, point three out, I, I, I would talk about how Jesus, Miss Anna Rees, stepped all over Peter's plan. Peter's plan was to go home. Now the Prince of Peace has his own plan. And y'all like to quote, uh, uh, when is Jeremiah 29 11? He knows the plan that he has for me to prosper me. So, so Jesus steps on Peter's boat. Now, this is not the first time uh, Peter had met Jesus. Read John chapter number one. Uh, Peter's brother had, uh, had been a disciple of John the Baptist, meet Jesus, and then come and get his brother and said, we found him a site. But, but he has not yet called him to be his follower or to be his disciple. So that's why Peter could just let Jesus walk on his boat. All right? Now, Peter invited, I'm, I'm sorry, welcomed Jesus on the boat. Now, and when he welcomed Jesus on the boat, check out the text, he let Jesus have his way. Now, many of you would allow him on your boat, and boat is a, meta, uh, is, uh, is a metaphor for um, 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 your life, is a metaphor for your job, is a metaphor for your marriage, is a metaphor for your relationship, is a metaphor for the church you go to. That's your boat. You invite him on, I mean, you welcome him on your boat, but you don't let him have his way. Devil, Jesus stepping on my boat would have been good enough. I would have got to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I'm not a tongue talker, but I may talk in tongue. 
Jesus stepped on Peter's boat. And when he stepped on the boat, he prayed. Now, I don't know why the King James used the word prayed. That word should be asked or requested him that he would move away from the land. They were about to push him into the boat, on the, I mean, to the, into the water. Understand the story. Jesus is on the lake, uh, on the shore of the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, whichever one you want to call it. The people are pressing. They're about to push him in the water. He looks out and sees Peter mending his net, getting ready to go home, and he steps on Peter's boat, and he tells Peter, and then he does, he, does, he, he does two things when he gets on Peter's boat. I'm telling y'all, stepping in on my boat would, have been, would, would be good enough. And my prayer is, Lord, step on the boat. Lord, step into the boat. Lord, step into my life. Lord, step into my marriage. Lord, step into my family. Lord, step into my job. Yeah, I'm going down the alley. Lord, step into the church I found. Lord, Lord, step in. And when you step in my relationship, step into my fellowship. Lord, just step, 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 step. And that ought to be your prayer today. Lord, step into my situation. Because if he steps into your situation, your situation will never be the same again. Notice the Prince of Peace changes Peter's plan. Peter planned to go home. First thing he does is he gives him his, Jesus gives him this plan. The plan is plan A and plan B. Look at plan A. And he asked him, move away from the land. Peter said, cool. Peter had no problem with Jesus asking him to move away from the land. Peter didn't say, I'm tired. I'm, I'm getting ready to go home. I'm washing my neck. You interrupted. Peter acquiesced to what Jesus, so not only did he welcome him on the boat, he let him have his way while he was on the boat. As I said, many of y'all wanted to come on the boat, but you don't want to have his way. Peter's tired, he's worn out, he, he's out of day work. Some say he's frustrated, I'll get back to that. I'm not sure whether he's frustrated or not, okay? text doesn't tell us how he did. All the text tells us is that Jesus asked him to thresh out a little from the land, and he did. I know that's right, Mr. Whitfield. Step into my situation. That's, that, that should be all of our prayer. All right? Now, so Peter lunches out, and Jesus sits down, because that's the way a rabbi would teach. He sat down and talked the people out of the ship. So, so Jesus came on board the ship, Peter, Peter, Peter's ship, and Peter welcomed him, and now Peter let him have his way. Jesus tell him, he plan A, launch out from the from the um, from the shore. Peter does that, and Jesus teaches. Now we don't know what he taught, we don't know what he preached, we don't know. Okay? Now, verse, verse number four. If I had um um, the verse 4 would be uh, plan B. And when he had left preaching, we don't know how, how, how long Jesus preached, we just don't know. He said unto Simon, here's plan B. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, here's a principle for you. Whenever God gives you a plan, he couples the plan with the promise. Okay. See, many of you want promise, but you don't want the plan. And that's why many of you know half the scripture. All you know is promise, and you're not getting the promise because you ignore the plan. Teach Betty Brown's oldest boy. Let me, uh, let me give you an example. The promise is he will direct your path. He promises that. But what's the plan? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lay not unto thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, then you get the promise. You can't have the promise without first adhering to the plan. Glory to God. Here's the promise, he'll keep you in perfect peace. What's the plan? And y'all gonna say, he promised to keep me in perfect peace. No, what's the plan? Here's the plan. Thou will keep them in perfect peace. It's the promise or the plan whose mind is stayed on him. If you're not feeling the plan, you're not going to get the promise. Glory to God. His plan, walk in the spirit. That's our base scripture for everything. Walk in the spirit. What's the promise? And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
You cannot not fulfill the love of the flesh if you are not walking in the spirit. You cannot, please get this principle. You can't get the promise. See, a lot of times, preachers just give you a promise. No weapon for me to give me, no weapon for me to give me shall prophet. And y'all go quote. No weapon for me to give me shall prophet. That's, that's the promise. And most of y'all quote that one, but you don't know the plan. The plan in the next verse, it says this is the heritage of God's servants and those who walk uprightly. So the plan is you be, uh, you be a servant of God, a child of God, and you walk in his righteousness. But y'all want him, but y'all want to claim no weapon for him to give us your prophet, verse 17, and you know verse 18. No, you don't even know verse 18. Because y'all get so excited about the promise. No weapon for him to give us hallelujah, but what's the plan? Because we normally don't give y'all the plan. We just give y'all the promise. Why? Because all we want y'all to do is feel better. I want you to do more than feel better. I want you to do better. Because if I just make you feel better, you can feel better in your mess. And never want to get out of your mess because I made you feel better in your mess. Coming to grace, singing a song, let go and let God have his way. From the, the, the plan, the Lord is my shepherd. Everything else is predicated on you, on all the promises that come after that is predicated on you fulfilling the plan. If you're not your shepherd, then you don't get then then you don't get to say, uh, uh, I shall I won't, you are gonna want. He making me laugh. No, he has to be your shepherd. And here's what I want y'all to do. All of those promises that y'all say y'all standing on, go back and ask Brother Pastor, give me the plan that goes with the promise. Or you go look it up yourself and get the plan that goes with the promise. Glory to God. For God so loved the word, he gave his only begotten son. The plan that whosoever believeth in him. For the promise shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you don't believe in him, you are going to perish and you're not going to have everlasting life. It's just that simple. I want you to learn the Bible and not about the Bible. Jesus left preaching. Verse 4. He says unto Simon, launch out in the deep. Here's where preachers go off to talking about y'all need to get out of shallow water. That's fine. I have no problem with that because he's telling people to get it, Peter to get out of shallow water. Okay. And technically what he's saying is um, leave where leave the place where you are and go where I tell you. Shallow water is representative of, of, of where you are comfortable here. A shallow water is where you think things are happening. Look, look at what he said. Launch out in the deep. In other words, he's telling Simon Peter, go to a place where fish are, are traditionally not caught. And go fishing at a time where fish are traditionally not caught. What he's telling him is, do what I tell you to do and I'm giving you some, and I am giving you some strange instruction. I ought to have about five of y'all that know God will give you some strange instruction. Don't make no sense to your mind, but can I help you do it anyway? And I said that the, grammatically the way I want to say it. It don't make no sense to your mind, but if God says do it, I promise you it'll work. God told David to go into a cave, hide, hide, hide from Saul, and David went in there and didn't know what God was going to do. God just told the spider to weave away. Strange instruction. God will give you strange instructions. And you'll be scratching your head to mind. I don't know whether that's going to work or not. <laughs> oh my God. Moses stood before the red. God, Moses go to God and said, God, um, um, what am I going to use? God said, what's in your hand? He said, you know, stab. He said, what you use? What you got? Got to the Red Sea. God parted the Red Sea. God will give you, God told Elijah to go down to the brook. Strange instruction. What am I going to do there, God? I spoke to a raven. He's going to feed you. <laughs> oh, my God. God works miracles when you follow his strange 
instruction. If you're not following straight instruction, it's not a miracle. Peter, if you want to, if you want something different, do something different. He said, Peter, here's my, here's my plan. Launch out in the deep. I'm on the boat with you. And here's the promise. Let down your net for a catch. All I need is a plan and a promise. Oh my God. All I need from God is a plan and a promise. God, give me a plan and give me a promise. Okay? Check it out. And Simon, which is Peter, English, which is Cephas, Aramaic, which is uh, um, um, Petros, uh, Greek, said unto him, Master, now don't come up on the word master. Uh, that's just a word here in this context. It's a word of endearment, teacher, rabbi. Um, 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 that's the word. Now, you know the word curious, which we, which, which we usually get. Uh, is the equivalent to the word Lord. He's using uh, the generic word. It's sometimes translated boss, sometimes it's translated master, supervisor, uh, or, or um, rabbi, uh, rabboni. Okay, we have toil. Look now, now, if I had to label this verse 5, I would talk about Peter hung up in the past. Jesus gives him a plan and a promise. What's the plan? Launch out in the deep. What's the promise? You're going to catch some fish. What did Peter do? Stuck in the bag. Peter said, we have toiled. Who cares what happened last night? Too many of you all are stuck in the real view mirror worrying about what happened yesterday. Two days, you can't do it. I mean, two days you should never worry about it. Yesterday and tomorrow. Well, you shouldn't worry about it day either, but Jesus told you to don't worry about anything. Okay? Peter is stuck in the past. And notice what he said. Peter said, we have toiled, work all night and caught and we have failed. We have taken nothing. Peter goes into this diatribe about how they failed that day. Now, a lot of preachers, most, uh, most preachers said Peter, Peter was frustrated because they didn't catch anything, but I told y'all I don't like fishing. I don't go fishing, so don't invite me to go fish, fishing, and don't even invite me to eat fish if it's not late. Okay, but I've known people to go fishing all day when they get back. I said, "What you care? They, they said nothing. They weren't disappointed. They said it was relaxing. So we cannot assume that Peter was disappointed because he didn't catch anything or because he failed. That's right, coming today is a new day. Please understand me. Do not allow your daily failures to become your weekly failure, to become your monthly failure, to become your yearly failure, to become your lifelong failure. There will everybody can have anybody can have a bad day. Stop freaking out because stop freaking out because you had a bad day. How many of you have gone to work? Bright and early to, uh, to, and really wanted to get something done. And at the end of the day, you work from eight to five and you left there saying, Lord, I have accomplished nothing today. There are times and, and Covenant and Reverend Martin and, and Ed Reese and Yvonne H. Whitfield and Bernie Wallet and Dr. Gina Gina Morgan. Those are the only names I can see. There are times when you are just going to have a Dad, Jay, <laughs> glory to God. There are days when you are not going to feel like having a good day. There are days, good evening, mid -present. There are days you're going to have bad days psychologically. There are days you're going to have bad days health wise. There are bad days when you're just going to be tired. There are bad days when you're just not going. There are days when you're not going. You're just not going to want to be bothered. There are going to be bad days when you're going to be even even down in the dust with the blue. It's normal to have the only person in the world that never had a bad day with Jesus Christ. So stop freaking out because you had a bad day. I think Paul Jones said it best, Mary Jones, uh, uh, Mary, Mary Gunn. He said, all my good days outweigh my bad day. Now, if your bad days outweigh your good day, you got a problem. Stop making people, stop allowing people to make you feel less than a saint because you have, you have, I'm just having a bad day. It's okay. 
I don't feel like talking to you today. I'm having a bad day. Sometimes I, I go in restaurant or I go in store and people are not as friendly and, and I say, okay, you deserve it. I said to myself, they, they, they're just having a bad day. Don't make the day worse because Peter just had a bad day. He said, Lord, we toiled all night and caught nothing. Had a bad day. What you telling me to do don't make sense. But I like what Peter did. Peter said, nevertheless, never. And here's one of those incidences where the charismatics taught us wrong. You don't have to have perfect faith. You don't have to have all these perfect confessions to, for Jesus to move. He didn't have, um, the man in Mark um, two, uh, 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 4 uh, didn't have a perfect confession. He came to Jesus and said, I know you can if, if you will. I mean, Mark 1 and 2. He, blurred out. he said, I know you can, even if you will. Matter of fact, next week, I think we will deal with him. He didn't have perfect confession. Peter said, Lord, basically, we toiled all night, didn't catch anything, had a bad night, but I changed my plan to meet your plan because I trust you. Ain't got perfect faith, but I trust you. I trust what you say. Okay? I trust your word. I trust your promise. But wait a minute, Peter. In order to get the promise, you got to do what? You got to stick with the plan. Peter, you can't get the promise of a lot of fish. That's it, Reverend Stoke. Nevertheless, at his word, I'll do what you say. Oh, my God. Don't make sense, Lord. I got to love my enemy. But at your word, I'll do what you say. It doesn't make sense, Lord, that I got to pray for those that despite will use me, but I'll do what you say. I will do what you say. Lord, don't make sense for me to commit myself to go to church. Tired, tired as I am, be heard, but I'll do what you say. I will never, all of us need to have a nevertheless. I'll do what you say. I will, he says, at thy word, I'm going to do what the plan says to me. Verse 6. And when they had done this, what? Followed the plan. Let down the net. They enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. It, it didn't mean that the net was breaking. In the Greek, it said their net was breaking. Because if the net breaks, they're going to lose all the fish. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ships, that they should come and help them. Everybody get blessed. When you follow the plan, oh my God, Mid Bernie Wallace and Ann, when we follow the plan, not only are we blessed, but those connected to us will be blessed. I'm talking about everybody got blessed. I'm not making it up. And Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet. I'm sorry. And he beckoned them up, and they came. Overflow more than enough. So they began to say they had so much fish that the boat began, it didn't sink, it was beginning to sink. Miracles and wonder. They 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 were begin uh, yeah, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Why? Because he followed the plan. He had a promise and plan. Everybody, everybody. In the company got blessed. Everybody in the church got blessed. Everybody in the business got blessed. Everybody in the family got blessed. Everybody, 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 everybody. And I know who got blessed. Those who followed the plan. There's other James and John. They said, "Well, that ain't the way to do it." They just came over and did and helped them with the fish. Okay. Now notice what Peter does. And Simon Peter saw it. Saw what? Tanya said, is that winning season? Yes, ma'am. Is that win and it's your winning season too when you follow the plan. Okay? When Peter saw it, he saw this drought. I mean not drought, this catch. He fell at his knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now he's recognizing who he is. Back in verse 5 when he called him master, 
That was generic for rabbi, teacher, good man. Now he's recognizing him as Lord. Why? Because he heard him preaching. Now he sees the miracle. Now, this is important. Look at that word Lord. It has a capital L. That's the covenant. That means it's the covenant name for God. Whenever you see the, um, I think it's in all, all the English Bible. I'm not sure. I know in the King James Bible. When you see the word lowercase l, it's, the, it's just the word for boss and manager or, or, or supervisor. But when you see that um, um, a large l capitalized, certainly when you see all letters cap cap capitalized, that's the covenant name of God, which was uh, tetragrammation, tetragrammaton, Exodus chapter 3, where he said to Moses, I am the verb to be, I am whatever I need to be. Go tell Israel, I am Yahweh. And then they, and then they Latinize and your witness call him Yehovah or Jehovah. That's his covenant name, Yahweh, Jehovah. That means the supreme being. And the Jews um, were so scared to pronounce Yahweh or uh, Yehovah until they substituted the word Adonai. <laughs> Adonai. Okay, which translated to our word um, Lord. Okay, Peter, Peter fell down on his knee. Now, so why do people fall, fall on his knee? He fell on his knees because, oh my God, get this, this is good, and this is the Holy Spirit. Because when you see him right, you'll see you. The reason you don't see you because you have not seen him. Because if you ever see him and see him rightly, you will see you like Peter saw you, saw himself. Lord, I'm son. Lord, I am a sinner. Lead me. Now, now where Peter, now where Peter wanted him to go, Peter just simply said, I'm not worthy to be in your sight. I am a sinner. I missed the mark. I got the issue. Okay. Verse number um, nine. For he was astonished at all that were with him, that the catch of fishes that they were taking. They were just amazed at this miracle that Jesus had performed. He gave him a promise and he fulfilled the promise. Why? Because they fulfilled the plan in the promise. They went against what they thought they knew. They went against what or what tradition said that they don't fish this time of day. They don't fish in the deep water. But we did. But we had a nevertheless. And I'm talking to somebody that God's gonna get that that you're gonna adopt the nevertheless, and, and you're gonna testify that I didn't think it was gonna happen. But nevertheless, God did it anyway. <laughs> oh my God! What a mighty God we serve. Okay, verse number eleven. I'm sorry. And so was also James and John. Those were his business partners. Sons of Zebedee. Jesus named them sons of thunder. We'll deal with them later. Which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. Man, get up. I don't need to depart. You're going to depart. For henceforth thou shalt catch men. In other words, you shall use the characteristics that made you successful in fishing. Now you're going to catch them. I just told you that he's not telling everybody to be pictures of men. Now that you're fishing. Okay. And when they had brought their ship. Now verse 7. Verse 11 is interesting to me. And when they had brought their ship to land. They forsook all and followed him. I wonder what they do with the fish. See these big not people want to know. Because y'all know I'm, I'm kind of cool. I wonder what they do with the fish. The Bible doesn't tell us. It just says that when they came to land. You know because I think it was their. James and John did this business. Or they were in there together. But uh, they just left the fish, it looked like. Now whether they left the fish, they took the fish and secured it, gave it away, I don't know, but I just find verse 11 kind of interesting. Okay, I got a few more minutes, so let's continue. Um, verse number 12, and it came to pass, it's a period of time, we don't know how long. He was in a certain city, don't know what city it was, the whole, a man came full, <laughs> I know that's right, full of leprosy. All right, leprosy was a skin disease. We just teach, we just preached this several weeks ago, so I'll be brief. Um, the person with leprosy had to um, stay away from society. Um, the person with leprosy had to 
holler out there to be honest. I am unclean, I am unclean. And when I preach it, I talk about how if we would be that honest uh, and advertise. See, we don't have to advertise our ailment. We don't have to publicize our problem. The leprosy by law had to publicize his problem. It, aren't you glad? I am. Because none of us would be safe if we had to advertise our, if, if, if we had to advertise our uh, adversity, if we had to publicize our problem. Can you imagine the liar having to tell people, I'm a liar? Had to wear a sign said, I'm an adulteress, I'm an I, no, no, no. But that's what the leper had to do. They had to cry out unclean. But he saw Jesus, he fell on his face, worship. Because that's what worship means, to prostrate yourself before God. Prostrate yourself before God. And he begged him, saying, Lord, that that word, Lord, is, if thou will, thou can make me clean. Imperfect faith. Imperfect faith. I know you can. I don't doubt your ability. I did not sure you will. Im See, sometimes you just got, you got, you got to come to God, and you ain't got to be so, you ain't got, oh my God, you don't have to be so formal. How are our father about? Just say, God, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, but I know I need you to bless me. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, prayer, prayer does not always have to be formal. Just talk to the Lord. Lord, I had a bad day. I don't want to have a bad night, so Lord, give me some strength. You know, just talk to God. Yeah, okay. So, so the man fell down and said, Lord, if, if you will, thou can make me clean. Okay. I can, thou, thou can make me clean. Verse 13. And he put forth his hand to him and said, okay, I will. why did Jesus touch this man? Because it was against the law to touch a leper. Because if you touch a leper, you will get contaminated. Jesus touched a leper to let us know that he can deal with any situation we have and not get contaminated. Oh my God. To let him know if he stepped into this man's situation and to teach others that there's nothing he can't do. So your problem is not too big for God. I don't care how man sees your problem. If it's too big for you, it's just right for God anyway. Jesus said, I will be thou clean. Check this out. And immediately the leprosy departed from him so that Jesus healed him. Okay? You don't have to have perfect faith to get healed. Okay. But the guy did have perfect faith in Jesus' ability. He didn't have perfect faith in Jesus' willingness. Because sometimes, sometimes uh, we don't know the will of God. I know they tell you, you know, sometimes you don't know the divine will of God. We thought the divine will for uh, Paul would have been to heal him of whatever he had. But we didn't say, I give you more grace. We would have thought when David prayed uh, for his sin, I mean, for his son to be healed, God would say, okay, I hear your son. God said, no, he's going to die. We don't know what God's will is all the time. But we pray. We pray because prayer does work. It just, it just doesn't work the way all the time we want it to work. Glory to God. You say, I'll touch it. Touch it. And it let, immediately, it left to depart from him. Verse 14. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest. The word priest from the Latin word pontiff, which means bridge builder. Preachers, y'all will see that again. And offer according to the law of Moses, commanded the testimony of them. Go, let the priest examine you, and the priest will know that you no longer have leprosy because there's a new healing in town. Okay. But this idiot, we call him an idiot because we like to glorify this man because we know the song said I wasn't going to tell it, but I couldn't keep it to myself. He's an idiot. If the Lord tells you not to tell it, don't tell it. Because it's going to cause Jesus some problem. This man went out and, tell it and told it everywhere he went. And so Jesus had to leave. And Mark said that Jesus had intended on going throughout the cities of, of, of Galilee. But because the man told him to cause such an uproar, Jesus left the cities and went to the desert. If Jesus tells you not to tell it, no. Now, Jesus, I don't know whether Jesus caught up with the man and said, idiot, I told you not to tell it. We don't know what happened. 
but we know that if Jesus tells you not to tell it, I don't care how bad you want to tell it, keep it to yourself. Okay? Uh, what, what happened next? Uh, here it is. And it came to pass a certain day of Jesus teaching. Okay. Uh, take a look, uh, let me stop there. I'll pick that up there next week as we just want to let the tech do the talk. Woo! That's it for tonight. Uh, we covered 17 verses of Luke chapter number 5. God bless y'all tonight. Uh, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We will continue with that. If you enjoy what we do on Thursday, uh, make Mount Vernon a place you may want to check us out. Now, we're not for everybody. God knows I'm not for everybody. Um, but if you want to be taught the word of God, I find it interesting that Jesus promoted preaching. Jesus promoted preaching. I think they, they came to him in Mark 4 and said, that's a more folk need to be healed. They want to be healed. Jesus said, I don't know. I got to go to the city and preach here. They let you know that he's teaching and preaching. And you can always tell, please, 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 please check this out. You can always tell where a preacher or pastor's heart is by what they promote. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated some, sometimes by, uh, especially black, I'm not, well, especially Baptist, I'm not looking at that, about, about preachers who like to entertain, they will promote snippets of them entertaining. And I, and I be saying to myself, I'm not here to entertain you, I'm not here to teach you. I tell you, go on Facebook and see what preachers are promoting because they play into this idea that they are promoting entertainment. They are promoting the hoop because you, because you see them. Am I criticizing? I'm not, I'm not trying to. I'm just trying to get you to see what preachers are promoting. And you see, so and so closes. And that's all you see. That's all they ever post are themselves closing, hooping and hollering. So, so what are they saying? Come hear me hooping and holler. Now, I'm not against hooping and hollering. But if that's all you promoting, and then some of them, all they're promoting is dancing and shout. So what are they saying? Come, and we're going to dance and shout. No, promote the preaching of the gospel. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with hearing you hoop and holler, but I want to see the meat. I want to see how you exegete a text. I want to see how you theologically disseminate the text. Watch Facebook and see what your pastor and the preachers are promoting. Because what they are promoting is what they are telling you to come here. And at some point, you got to want more than a hoop and a hop. And a turn to your name. Glory to God. That's it for the night. God bless y'all. Um, until Sunday morning, a uh, peace unto you. Assalamu alaikum. God bless you. If you like, if you enjoyed the sermon, the teaching tonight, share it. Uh, share with somebody else. Peace, y'all. Until next time.